Recording in progress. Hereby call to order the Roseville City Council meeting for Monday, October 10th, 2022. Mr. City Manager, would you call the roll, please? Councilmember Wilmis. Councilmember Strawn. Here. Councilmember Etten. Here. Councilmember Groff. Here. Mayor Rowe. Here. Uh, and with us at the dais, we have our City Attorney Mark Hagen, who's on my right at the end of the dais, and our City Manager Pat Trudgeon on my left at the other end of the dais. We have a number of staff and department heads and uh, guests and consultants who will be participating in the meeting as various agenda items come forward, and we'll introduce them at those, at those times. Would ask folks uh, to make sure you silence your cell phone or otherwise assure that it doesn't disrupt the meeting. And I believe, do we have some remote participants as well, Mr. Trudgeon? We had a couple signed up, but nobody's on right now. Nobody's on right now, okay. So we'll forego the um, instructions for online mm -hmm. participants then, which everybody will be happy about. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, uh, we have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. If uh, folks are able to stand, please stand for the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, God Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right, and before we get to approval of the agenda tonight, uh, just on a point of personal privileges, I wanted to read a uh, statement. Uh, and it reads as follows Roseville water users have recently begun receiving their quarterly bills with an insert describing underbilling that occurred since our tiered conservation water rates went into effect in January of 2021. Essentially, during that time, all water usage for residential and commercial users during that time was billed at the lowest tier rate rather than applying higher tier rates for usage above that lowest tier. The city apologizes for this error and for not catching it sooner. Measures have been put in place to assure that it will not happen again through testing and verification of the entry of rates and tiers into the billing system, audits of random bills, and supervisory review. It's important to note that on average about two-thirds to three-quarters of our commercial and residential water users uh, consume less than the threshold amount of water per quarter uh, to be billed at any higher tier rates. So most water bills, uh, water users have not been underbilled during this time. However, the rest of the users uh, have been underbilled at least to some degree, and in some cases uh, for very high users, the amounts are quite significant. City staff expects on October 24th to bring forward information to the council and the public about the financial impact of the underbilling and options to address the resulting shortfall in revenues. That conversation will be important because water uh, usage billing not only pays for the wholesale cost of buying water from the St. Paul Water Utility, but also the wages and benefits for city water employees as well as supplies, materials, and other annual operating expenses uh, for providing water in the city. To the extent our usage billing uh, did not cover those costs due to the underbilled amounts, the city must use funds that are set aside for water infrastructure rehab to fill the gap, potentially leading to delays in infrastructure work. Again, this topic is planned to come back in greater detail on October 24th at this time, uh, but given that the inserts are going out in water bills so recently, uh, we felt a brief explanation tonight was deemed appropriate. Uh, and I forgot to check, um, Mr. Trudgeon, if folks in the public have questions about this, is there a particular person that we should be directing them to? Yes, you can direct them to Michelle Petrick, our finance, finance director. director. Right. Once again, that's Michelle Petrick, our finance director, uh, would be the contact person for questions on that. And we will certainly, as I said, have that item coming back before the council for more detailed discussion on the 24th. With that, we have uh, tonight's agenda for approval next, and I wanted to check with staff. Are there any changes uh, from a staff perspective, Mr. Trudgeman? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, we do have uh, item 7C, which is request to perform an abatement for unresolved violations of city code at 795 Terrace Drive. We can remove that. The um, violations have been corrected and verified by staff, so no further action is needed, and that item can be totally removed from the agenda. All right, thank you, Mr. Trudgeon. Uh, are there items uh, that uh, council members would like to have changed on the agenda this evening or uh, items to remove from the consent agenda for separate consideration? No. All right. Uh, we'll just do a quick check with members of the public uh, related to that consent agenda that I just mentioned. That's uh, section 10 of tonight's agenda. Uh, it's normally items like approving our payments, our check register, uh, and a number of other sort of administrative type matters that are normally taken up as a single motion without uh, opportunity for a lot of public comment or feedback. Uh, but we do want to make sure that if anybody is here for an item in section 10 of tonight's agenda, 
and certainly copies of the agenda are available in the back if anybody needs that. Um, we do want to hear from you at this time and we'll make sure and consider that item earlier in the meeting so that you don't have to wait till the end uh, for that item. Uh, our business items in section seven, uh, the uh, public hearing on the liquor license, the presumptive penalty on the tobacco uh, uh, violation, uh, civic campus pre-design report and the uh, appointing council members to the city attorney interviews process, uh, those will all be uh, taken up with opportunities for public comment. But once again, section 10, if anybody is here for one of those items, just let us know at this time so that we can take that up separately. I'm not seeing anyone. And Mr. Trudgeon, still nobody online participating. The only person on is for a uh, later agenda item as a okay. consultant. All right, very good. Uh, then, with that, since it doesn't appear we have any changes to the agenda, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Right, it's been moved by Councilmember Etten, seconded by Councilmember Strawn. Uh, and I just, uh, well, we can cover that after this. Uh, any discussion on the motion? No. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes four to zero. Uh, and is approved. I just did want to note under the roll call that uh, Councilmember Wilmus uh, indicated he would not be able to be here this evening and so uh, wanted to make a note of that for the record. Uh, with that, that then brings us to public comment. This would be an opportunity for members of the public to speak to items that are not on tonight's agenda uh, but may be of either interest to folks in the city or related to city business. Uh, once again, we'll provide an opportunity for public comment as agenda items come up uh, later in the agenda, but we do want to also provide this opportunity at the start of each meeting for anyone from the public to speak on an item that isn't on tonight's agenda, but as I said, is related to city business or of interest to people in the city. I will check if there anyone here this evening to speak on a non-agenda item at this time. Just let us know. Does not appear to be the case. Do we have any additional online participants? We do not, no. Mr. Mayor. Okay. All right. Then seeing no one uh, come forward for public comment in the general sense, uh, then we'll move right to our agenda. And our first item tonight is to hold a public hearing uh, to approve or deny an on sale and Sunday uh, liquor license for Mito LLC. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Trudgeon to introduce that item. Once again, that's 7A on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you mentioned, we're here for, uh, tonight to conduct a public hearing to consider the approval of an on-sale with the Sunday sales liquor license uh, for Mito LLC or Tulum Hall, uh, located at 2801 Snelling Avenue. Uh, for a reference point, uh, it used to be the old Grumpies. Um, they have submitted the um, required information and we're completing that review. And uh, after that review, we do uh, suggest that the City Council do grant a liquor license with Sunday sales as well as an outdoor endorsement. We had the opportunity to earlier today meet with the applicants and talk through their business plan and they are aware of our um, requirements for server training. They have a very robust uh, carding um, program in place to make sure that only people over 21 are served alcohol. They're gonna have a variety of uh, meal options as well as uh, other opportunities for people to enjoy themselves at the, uh, at the facility. So we look forward to them being here and, and, and look forward to the partnership with them as, as well. But as I said, uh, we have reviewed the information and they are eligible for um, um, the issuance of a liquor license as indicated in the RCA. All right, and uh, I should check also they're aware of the, uh, the uh, revenue requirement that uh, uh, yes, uh, no yep. more than 50% of their revenue can come from alcohol sales. That's, that's correct. We talked very specifically about that uh, today as well as the server training. Got it. All right. Uh, do you know if a representative of the of the uh, applicant wishes to speak this evening, or are you just here to answer questions if any come up? Okay. All right. We'll see if any questions come up. I'll turn it over to the council. Are there any questions for staff or the applicant? All right. Seeing none. Uh, looks like you're off the hook, at least for now. <laughs> um, with that, this is a public hearing, so we will open it up for anyone from the public who wishes to speak in support of or opposition to this uh, liquor license being granted. Uh, once again, if anybody from the public wishes to speak, we just ask that you come up and have a seat at the table. Uh, the time limit per speaker is three minutes. We ask the council uh, that questions and comments be addressed to the city council. Uh, and we'll take up any such uh, items as they come up uh, at the end of any public comment. With that, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak in support or opposition to this liquor license application? All right, seeing no one come forward, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and move to council consideration. We've got the request to approve the on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales as well as the outdoor endorsement. I would move that motion. 
Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Atten, seconded by Councilmember Groff to approve those licenses and endorsement as applied for. Discussion of the motion as the maker, Councilmember Atten. Glad they're coming in. Thanks for being here. All right. Seconder. Look forward to seeing the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? I'm just glad that we will have a occupant in that space and we can move forward into our next generation of uh, exciting dancing, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, and if there's no other discussion, we've got the motion before us to approve the licenses. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously four to zero, and that is all approved. Thank you again for being here, and we wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, then, that brings us to item 7B, which is to consider uh, authorizing presumptive penalty for Quick Mart for a tobacco violation. And I believe we have our uh, police chief, uh, Eric Scheider, with us this evening for this item because Deputy Chief mm -hmm. is at the <laughs> FBI Academy. I guess he is. <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't find anyone else to delegate it to. I bet, I bet. Right. Um, You're welcome. As a reminder, each year the Roseville Police Department conducts two compliance checks for all of our tobacco licenses in the city. We also do this for our alcohol um, licenses as well. We also have our plainclothes officers go in to watch for any violations of the flavored tobacco being sold where it shouldn't be. In July of 2022, we mailed out letters to all of the license holders letting them know of the requirements and that these checks would be conducted, uh, two of them before the end of the year. And those checks started on Saturday, J uh, July 17th, 2020, 2022. We had an 18-year-old um, underage checker and a plainclothes officer that conducted the citywide checks. I'll note that the 18-year-old that we used had a vertical license and we did include that in the packet. It does indicate that they're under the age of 21. And during the checks that we conducted, we had two businesses fail and we're here tonight for uh, one, which is the Quick Mart, which is located at 2815. Just a quick summary of the failures at 10:15 uh, a.m. The 18-year-old checker went into the business. She requested to purchase a pack of cigarettes. The cashier did ask her for an ID and did check it but then completed the transaction and sold the cigarettes. The checker uh, left the store with the cigarettes and then the seller admitted to the plainclothes officer that he had uh, completed the sale. This is a quick marked second violation in 36 months. We also had another violation back on June 15th, 2021. In that case, no identification was requested from the checker. And so the Roseville Police Department is bringing this case forward and recommends approval of the presumptive penalty pursuant to city code 30609 for a second violation in 36 months, 36 months, which would be a $2,000 fine and a three day tobacco sale uh, suspension. And there is a representative from the business here tonight if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Chief. Are there any questions for uh, the Chief on this uh, violation? All right. And uh, do we have questions for the, uh, the um, representative of Quick Mart uh, from the council? Does the representative from Quick Mart wish to speak uh, this evening in support of or in uh, refutation of their uh, penalty? No? Or yes? I don't, I don't want to. It's entirely up to you as to whether you want to speak, but we do want to give you that opportunity. Hello, my name is Ahmed. I'm, I'm the owner of Quick Mart, and I have uh, I get emergency call, and I have my buddy who the one sold the tobacco to that person, and I really run out the store for 40 minutes to take care of the emergency I had, and I came back. He told me this, what happened, and explained to me how that happened, and uh, the really. What I'm really upset about the day before that, I show him the paperwork you guys sent it to us, and I explained to them how serious and how important that is. And the fact he did it the second day, I just, I have really talked to him beside yesterday about that. He's really upset me a lot. And not only that, I changed the whole system, so I get a new system who's double check, make sure the person who's over 21, and it's about it. All right. Well, thank you for uh, helping us to understand the circumstances and what you've done since then. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Um, we uh, are being asked once again to authorize the presumptive penalty. I should just check, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this uh, request to authorize the penalty for the tobacco violation? All right. Seeing no one, then, uh, we have the request before the council. Uh, is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Second. All right. That was moved by Council Member Groff, seconded by Council Member Strawn to authorize the uh, issuance of the presumptive penalty, which once again is a $2,000 fine and a three-day suspension of the tobacco sale license. Um, any discussion on the motion as the maker, Council Member Groff? Uh, I just appreciate that you put a, uh, in place a, a better system, hopefully, because as you know, the fines get higher as the, they go on and, and your license can be revoked eventually, so it's very serious. So thank you for working on it. Right. Any other discussion? Seconder. I, I thank the owner for being here and for offering your um, information. And uh, yeah, hopefully, your system—it's hard to control others, but yeah, it's part of what we ask. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other discussion? All right. Hearing none. Once again, we've got the motion before us to authorize the issuance of that presumptive penalty. Uh, with no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. That passes unanimously four to zero, and that penalty is authorized. Thank you again, Chief. Um, and that brings us then to item 7D, since 7C has been removed from the agenda. 7D is to uh, consider accepting the final Civic Campus pre-design report, and we have uh, City Manager Trudgeon uh, introducing this item for us and the various folks who will be participating. Mr. Trudgeon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you mentioned, we're here to uh, receive uh, a report on the Roseville Civic Campus pre-design work. As you know, we began seriously talking about uh, the city campus and what our master plan was uh, in 2021. As a result of the master plan, we did authorize BKV Group uh, as well as others to work on a pre-design of the Civic Campus to help um, narrow down kind of what our choices are and look at design elements of it and then also cost that uh, out and tonight we are here uh, to talk and give a final report with uh, the projected cost for that. I know a few meetings ago you had a detailed meeting about some of the design work and uh, I think the team tried to reflect that in the final work but certainly this is a, a work in progress so certainly we welcome in your comments on that. Uh, I'll lead off with Susan Morgan of BKV who will walk us through the presentation and other support uh, as well for detailed questions are with her as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor, Council. Uh, so this serves as wrapping up our work with you on this pre-design effort. So what we wanted to do tonight is to just provide a summary of our work to date because we've had a couple of touch points, but just to kind of reaffirm um, what we've moved through in this process and how that's allowing us to provide a higher level of detail in both our planning and our costs for your continued consideration and implementation. Side by side on the screen here, on the left hand side, you're seeing the initial uh, project goals of the overall Civic Campus Master Plan, and that was that long term plan for the city's facilities with a specific focus here on the consolidated downtown Civic Campus. And as part of this pre design, where we're looking at that first phase of work focused on the maintenance, VFW, license, and passport center, uh, you're seeing some commonality in those project goals. Um, and also a specific expansion that was allowing us to focus on things like establishing some preliminary design strategies, which we've done in dialogue with the community members and with yourselves, uh, providing a detailed, more detailed project phasing strategy so that we're able to kind of move through potential implementation and understand how that implements uh, down the line. And ultimately in service of refining what was more generalized project costs at the time of the Civic Campus Master Plan, and especially now that we're in a kind of post-pandemic period to have reaffirmed that with current market values. As a reflection and a summary, as part of pre-design, we go through another pass at space programming. And so while in the overall Civic Campus Master Plan, we worked with individual departments, talked through space needs, provided projections related to staffing and operations, this is an opportunity for us and our teams to reaffirm that with each of the departments. So further dialogue, revisiting workflows, um, actually starting to look in greater detail at specific placement of individual spaces and uses. And so what you're seeing here is a comparison on screen, a center column of the existing square footages of each of these facilities and the proposed square footages. 
And in each case, the proposed square footages are reflecting both current best practices today for space use and space planning. They're accommodating some of those projected staffing changes, uh, some of the operational changes that are, that are needed, and working with, in this case, both license passport maintenance, but also VFW, to engage in those conversations about their aspirations and projections for who they are and how they operate in the future. Um, you're seeing, just as a bullet summary here, some of the highlights of each of those facilities. A reminder that the License and Passport Center includes two distinct operating areas for those facilities. It also includes a flexible use dance studio on a second floor that's accessed by an elevator, so it's fully accessible, um, with some additional city office space, and that allows us to be pretty efficient in the footprint by having a stacked footprint for that facility. For the VFW post, um, and I will pause here in my long litany and say, a pre-design moves the dial forward. It is not the end point. It is a, a pre-design effort. So with each of these groups, um, any next step would include another round of programming and planning and design before you move into documents that are available for construction. So the same is true here with the VFW. An initial affirmation of continuing uh, some of the key features like the dining room and the bar, uh, having a flexible meeting and, and event rental space, which is important. And as part of maintenance, we're looking at a consolidation of facilities, including those you have today, uh, as well as your offsite um, leased space. So now all of that is home on one space, um, as well as the necessary exterior spaces of maintenance, including the yard area and workspace. I'll briefly summarize that our engagement, as you know, was led by Eden Resources. We have um, Tosh on the phone here if there are any questions. I'll just provide a highlight here. We're really proud that uh, in the multiple touch points that we have, as you see, there were nine different ways that we connected with residents throughout this pre-design, that we were able to reach 100% of Griggs Street and Lexington residents, which is especially important given the proximity of our uh, maintenance facility to those residences. We did connect with 130 different respondents across all of our various connection points, um, which is critical. And, you know, as an interesting kind of subset of this, for a project of this scale and focus, um, we did reach 9% of Roseville residents who were either informed or chose to participate in the process in some way. Um, so we believe that we've been able to build on our engagement of the Civic Campus Master Plan, and we would foresee and recommend that continued engagement would occur in any future stages as well. As you folks have heard before, this slide summarizes the prevailing themes from residents and neighbors. I think the critical concern and the reason why it's at the top of your page um, is bringing in a maintenance facility uh, in lieu of a park is a concern to residents for lots of reasons. Uh, impacts to property values, um, compensation or offsets um, for the hardship of change in use, uh, of living through construction, of the potential impacts of operations. Um, those concerns and the perceptions about views and noise, pollution, stormwater drainage, operations appearance, all of those um, were refrains that we heard from not one resident, but many, and those on both sides. And, um, as you folks are aware, we have done our work in exploring different strategies um, to plan the site, to try to minimize um, ongoing operational impacts, um, to be efficient and strategic with our construction, to minimize construction durations, and to use offsets with landscape design that will allow us to buffer noise, sight lines, um, and concerns. Uh, and we also have had a civil engineer as part of this process. Um, we always like to remind everyone uh, the law requires us to manage all of our stormwater on site, so none of it leaves the site. Um, and so that is something that we have to comply with um, regardless. Other key items here, and I'll just point out a couple of others, fiscal responsibility, um, continued uh, interest by those about um, reuse or repurposing of existing buildings, which was something which was explored in detail in the campus master plan. Uh, commitment to sustainability for new construction has been a refrain from, from various um, touch points, and an interest in how this project might be funded continues to be of interest to residents. As we've heard in our conversations, uh, both with you and with residents, as part of a pre-design, we like to kind of put into the record um, information and feedback that we have, in this case, priorities for design development. 
um, continued exploration of those edge conditions on Lexington um, and on Greek Street. Um, interest in landscape berming, plantings, fencing, what are those things that can manage that edge? Uh, mindfulness about intentional public facades. Uh, what do these buildings look like from a public way and do they match the quality that's been established in such facilities as fire station number one? Uh, that includes everything from our site to our facilities and things such as lighting and pedestrian safety, which is I believe something that you folks had highlighted in our last touch point. Uh, new facilities are proposed to draw on materials from the existing facilities uh, to use potentially similar details as a way of establishing maybe a broader unified campus identity. So that opportunity is something that exists and it's one that we want to take into account cost-wise as we look at quality, durability, and value. Uh, just a, a refresher here on, on where this first phase is, which takes us from a center public green space, new parking, a new VFW, a new license center, uh, maintenance consolidated north of Woodhill with a single site for facilities, yard work, and uh, storage. Uh, those future items are uh, expansions at City Hall, um, work within police, et cetera. I just want to point out a couple of other things because this is familiar and we've seen you recently. Uh, a reminder that um, this pre-design includes relocation of the children's play space um, to number 11, so uh, potentially tucked in between the Lexington Avenue apartments and that's subject to dialogue because that property is not currently owned by the city, uh, but there's been some expressed interest and support from the apartments in continuing to explore that opportunity. Uh, we have added, uh, it, at this scale it looks small, but it's uh, 20 feet of landscape buffer on landscape, uh, landscape, pardon me, Lexington Avenue. Say enough L words in one night and you mix them up. Uh, so that includes a, an offset of the buildings, so a deeper landscape edge between the sidewalk and the facilities, uh, which was important for us. Um, a reminder that part of the conversation and dialogue with residents has included extending the public sidewalk um, along Woodhill down to Howard Johnson. Uh, that, as we understand it, could be covered under a separate budget because there may be allocations um, that allow for that. Um, and there was also an acknowledgement of the value of providing a pedestrian crossing at Griggs, um, which would provide safe access for those residents and their families to Howard Johnson Park. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dustin Phillips from Cross Anderson. Hey, our council members, thanks for having us tonight. Um, as Susan mentioned, my name is Dustin Phillips. I'm with Cross Anderson Construction Company. I worked alongside uh, BKV, Ortel, Eden Resources, and putting together the overall budgets, estimates, and project phasing. So we're going to walk you through a couple of the highlights as it relates to the phasing of the project and how we organize the budgets that you're going to see here in a, in a few moments. Um, phase one, as you can see up here on the screen, on the left-hand side, just for, for general uh, illustration, we have the demolition or assumed demolition or scope of demolition and on the right hand side build back of new construction. So in phase one, we'd start with the demolition of this north site. And I will say this, just to kind of preface why we landed on this project phasing before I, I dive into it. One was, um, as the team was having their user group meetings and talking through this, was making sure that the site functioned properly for the operations that you have ongoing for maintenance. The second being how it impacts the residents and making sure they're being good stewards of, of the folks that surround that given site. And three, how it impacts project pricing, what's efficient makes most sense for public dollars to get spent. So those were the three primary factors when we look at how we walked through and landed on the phasing that you're seeing here on the screen. I'm going to add in a number four, if I will, <laughs> which is we also took into account, and this is still, again, a pre-design moves us forward but isn't final. We were also looking at how to maintain operations in this first phase for both VFW and license and passport. And so that includes explorations of uh, modified and an attempt to limit impacts on uh, parking and site access as well. That's a very good point, Susan. And, and that's illustrated here. We're still leaving uh, intact the VFW and the existing license center and working around that to demo what's needed to put back phase one of the maintenance facility. That includes a large portion of vehicle storage and all of vehicle maintenance. Um, that still leaves for obviously a phase two of maintenance, which we'll talk about here in a bit. But that still gives them access out to Woodhill and keeps existing operations as they are um, for the VFW and license center. What's not illustrated on this drawing and needs to be taken into account is that um, the, the limits of where we section off for VFW to park and all that, that hasn't been coordinated as of yet. So these are assumptions and areas that can be moved around 
um, as design continues to develop uh, with those folks in mind. If we can maybe stay on phase one for just a moment, I think I saw a question, Councilman Grattan. Yes, please. Mr. Phillips, is the red line showing in that parking lot that is shared with the VFW our current property lines, or is that the line that we need to create this phase? I believe it's the line to create this phase, correct? Yes. Wrong. Okay. That's Does correct. this presuppose already working with the VFW to purchase the VFW's full property? Yes. Mm -hmm. But and in particular, pardon me, that is because of the proposed timeline sequencing here, which is these are the phases that we're about to see follow um, one year apart. So once the project is ready to proceed, you would be both planning, um, permitting, um, and budgeting for essentially these three as one project. You're just executing them in a cycle related to the moving puzzle pieces. Okay. But the assumption is that the VFW would continue operating in its current location despite phase one construction just to its north and west. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And that's a great question because that rolls into our phase two. The reason we're keeping those folks where they're at currently is because until we can take down a large portion of vehicle maintenance slash storage here, still leaving a portion of indoor storage there along with their administration area, then we can build back the new VFW and the license center. So essentially setting up a new spot for them rather than having to pay for rental spaces or a new spot somewhere else uh, temporarily while construction happens. From a phasing standpoint, this is the much more uh, economical uh, way to go about building. So this is phase two. Again, exact site limits and constraints for what gets put back are yet to be determined, but the areas where you see up here are how we've allocated the budgets uh, when you'll see those in the three, in the three different buckets. If I can on phase two there, um, so the the yard goes away in order to construct the license center and the um, and the VFW. So does that mean that the uh, that the maintenance facility is operating essentially without a yard for a portion of this phasing? Yeah, that would be correct, Mayor. The existing parking area that's around VFW uh, along just north of Woodhill then would become the pseudo operational temporary yard. Well, that it's being relocated. Okay, so that has been taken into account yeah, and it's understood been, yeah. by our operations people then. Correct. Okay, all right, thank you. And there'll be a portion of time in this in this scenario where you do not have a fueling station on that site due to that mm -hmm. very reason. Right. Councilman Bratton. What happens to communication tower that's between the fire station and the proposed, um, I can't think, I just have License a dance hall, center. license center. In the in both plans, both of the communication towers remain as is. So we have intentionally planned around them, including their outbuildings. Um, you're not seeing that in this scale of planning, okay. I but just it is I didn't know if I need my glasses and need to lean in, <laughs> yes. but I, I wasn't I wasn't seeing that, so yes. I, was, I wanted to understand that a little more, please. There, there's a, a little white dot underneath the green rectangle that's uh, <laughs> probably difficult to see at this scale. They're bigger than that. Okay, <laughs> it's a shadow too. Yeah. yeah. And then that brings us into phase three. So now that VFW and license center are relocated, that allows us to take over the remaining half of the north site and finish out the remainder of maintenance, um, along with all the yard spaces, storage, fuel islands, uh, salt and sand, everything remaining on the north half of Wood Hill would then be constructed. And towards the tail end when these facilities are constructed and we can relocate the remaining items from vehicle storage and administration, we go down again and demo out the remaining half of the south site and build back the green space and associated parking that would be part of phase three. So that is a high level look at the phasing, three different phases for how we're bucketing budgets for the project. All right, questions? Councilor Strong. This predated me, so can um, I have a estimate of what the cost of the VFW property is. I would assume that's not included in these projected costs. I think correct. acquisitions that's would correct. be included. The acquisition of the property is included in this? They, they are not. not included. Oh, okay. It is not included, okay. Correct. Do we have any estimate on that? I think probably all we have at this point is the, the assessed uh, value. Ramsey County assessed value, yeah. which is not necessarily an appraisal. Okay. Right. Do we know what that is? I do. I'm trying to recall it. <laughs> Give me a second and I'll look it up. Right. Okay. Yeah. Councilmember Hatton. I want to clarify what was just asked. 
and answered that even though this RCA says that the estimate is for associated site costs along with property acquisition, this does not include property acquisition at the BFW? Correct. Property acquisition is not included for, for those scenarios. Site so the RCA is not accurate? Well, it's the term for construction costs for site costs are including like utility lines, um, storm, uh, dealing with storm water on site, those different components to, to, to develop the infrastructure to build buildings, not the acquisition or land expenses associated with that. If I could just interject too, so we have not had a direct conversation about exactly what the transaction is. There's a cost to construct the VFW. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what that cost is, $10 million? Uh, I'm trying to remember. That, uh, that, that is in there, and there could be a scenario where you have a transaction where for the value of that property, we would put in that amount of dollars towards the construction, um, and then some, and then BFW would be paying for some of that as well. That all needs to be negotiated. Nothing's okay. been sorted out. So yes, it's not directly as a line item, but it could be factored in as part of the construction. We buy it for X, but we'll give, instead of giving you money, we'll put a credit towards you for that building. Okay. And so just to also give that a bit of context, in the Civic Campus Master Plan, because the arrangements were still to be considered, um, at that time, no costs associated with VFW, either property acquisition or long-term financial agreements were included because they could vary, vary by scenario. So those weren't included before and they will not be included in this report. We will um, clarify the itemization and the notes that, that those are excluded costs. Okay. But it does include the building cost. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and if I could, Mr. Mayor, the 2022 payable estimated market value is $907,000. The BFW, mm -hmm. so around a million. Uh, Councilor Bratton. Is there, I may have missed this, is there an estimated time frame if we were to preload the financing for all of it and we did phases one, two, and three back to back to back, what's our time frame total? Understanding that we can't really know in this Maybe row, an but upcoming slide to that effect. Yes. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> Perfect timing, rather. Thanks. Because in, in our work, um, because this is a part of other work, right, this is not the only thing that was recommended long term mm -hmm. for the city. city. Um, this really should be understood as a single project that simply has to be executed in pieces because of trying to retain operations for each of these three facility types. And so fundamentally, it's a single project which is built um, mm -hmm. across three years as you're seeing here. Okay. So we, we tried to align on the screen the budgets in a similar fashion and what you'd seen them in the last study. And what I'll say is that while different portions shifted uh, from one phase to the other, the only difference between what you're seeing on the screen here today and what you had on the screen before was that City Hall had some level of involvement with the last master plan where it's not in any of these numbers that you see here today. Um, the four different categories, or rather five different categories, would be your total building construction cost, your site construction cost, your design contingency, which is allowing you flexibility between now and the next uh, phases and renditions of design as that gets more narrowed in and developed, your construction contingency, which is money you should hold back during the cost of construction for those ancillary items or unforeseen conditions that pop up, whether that's soil correction, different things such as that, uh, that pop up when you're on site. And then your soft costs, which will be design costs, permitting costs, um, sack and whack fees, all of those ancillary fees, testing and inspections that go along with any construction project. So what you're seeing up here today is a, is a total construction project, not just bid values from contractors, but a total project cost uh, that the city should look at uh, as, it, as it relates to these phases. And I'll uh, just note that included in the soft costs are FF&E and technology. So yes. those are also included in that uh, line item. And FF&E for folks who don't know? Furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Mm. Yes. Those would be like tables, <laughs> chairs, you. everything to fit out a, a, a new build. And could, just you also, could you also um, tell me what sack and whack is? So like sewer acquisition charges, um, normally you get hit with from, from the uh, Met Council. Met Council, yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's associated city costs that go along with those as well. 
And some of the notes, uh, some of the items that differed from, from before to, to having this conversation now would be escalation that's factored for each year. So in the last report, you'd seen a timeline of a phase one of 2022 and a phase two of 2024 and a final phase in 2027. Um, as you can see up here, based on where we're sitting at for uh, schedule now would be 2025, 2026, and 2027 based on phasing. And as Susan mentioned, doing this sequentially year after year until the projects are completed. The costs above include compliance with B3 standards. So uh, as it relates to sustainability and those measures that need to get taken for, uh, for B3 compliance are included above. If there's, an if there's a discussion around furthering that to a net zero uh, facility, those costs can range anywhere from 5% to 15% more than what you're seeing up on the screen. So depending upon what level of sustainability uh, you'd like to achieve above and beyond B3, you have to take that into account that that's not currently in the numbers you see above. And that's 5 to 15% of? Of the total project cost. Okay, including contingencies and soft costs. Correct. Okay, because it, it, in the note it sounds like construction costs, and so I just wanted to make sure. And the reason we, we want to put that 5 to 15% of the total is because what you'll see is as construction costs go up, all of your ancillary design and contingency costs are going to go up along with that. Right. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, Council Member Hatton. For the geothermal, you're probably aware that many of our buildings are on campus currently are served by geothermal. Um, it says geothermal for all facilities. Is there a piece where you say, hey, it would make sense for certain buildings and not others uh, based on distance from the current system or the size of the building or things like that? You talk about that a little. Yes, and also related simply to the conductivity because even at the scale of the site that we're looking at, you might actually have a uh, different efficiency of your soils from south of Wood Hill to north of Wood Hill, and that would make geothermal more or less um, useful. Uh, there's also a newer system called a Darcy well that's a higher efficiency geothermal unit. Um, that means that you actually can drill fewer wells uh, with similar operations, but you have a higher upfront cost and some different long-term costs. And so that's one of the reasons why actually providing a number at this point is a little preliminary okay. because that discussion of uh, are we doing this per facility, are we trying to actually start to look at this as a campus-wide uh, solution um, starts to be part of the conversation and consideration. Okay. Thank you. So, and that just to add to that, so it sounds like just simply kind of adding this on to the existing geothermal isn't really an option necessarily. It's got to pretty much be more of a standalone geothermal for this facility for the maintenance on the north side of Wood Hill as opposed to just tying into what we have now. I, I will talk to that a little bit, Mayor. Uh, yes, most likely, and simply because of the size of the maintenance facility and the way the building type is predominantly a heated facility, not just heated and cooling. Um, Susan mentioned uh, the Darcy system, which actually taps into an aquifer. That usually um, does make the facility um, more efficient in the geothermal, but it is a considerable upfront cost. Um, and then within regards to the B3 uh, guidelines, by the time we get to 2025, 26, and 27, the amount of energy reduction from the uh, design baseline right now we're at 80% in 2022 so 2025 to 26 that energy reduction goes down considerably further so s some of those likelihoods of uh, additional systems or newer systems are going to be likely for the newer facilities Thank you, you do however get the possible credit within the B3 uh, standards for doing um, a campus system so that would have to look into what the current system is able to deal with and how it can be connected, as you mentioned. So, All right, Thank you. We also just wanted to provide, maybe in closing, just a little bit of summary to contextualize why these costs have changed uh, since the last time you saw them, because it probably feels pretty recent, but we've also lived through some pretty big market changes. Yes, so I will say in the last report, and I'm going to compare all, all in costs, so whether it's site costs, those soft costs that we mentioned, building construction costs, um, and that'd be for the maintenance facility, the VFW, and the license center, and removing City Hall from the last rendition. If you remove City Hall from the last rendition, you're hovering right around 50 million in total project cost. What well, we've seen in the last two years, and it depends on, on which reports you look at, but it's somewhere in the mid 30s for inflation percentages over the last two years, roughly 20% in the 2021, and we're targeting here in 22 to fall somewhere between the 10 and 15% total. That brings a $51 million project up by close to $18 million. 
from there, that brings us into today's dollars. And as you can see up here on the screen, we're targeting a 2025, 2026, and 2027 project at 7% inflation from right now. That's 21% in increased cost for the 2025 phase and 28% for the 2026 phase. We did uh, include inflation on the last to, to bring us up to a 2027 phase. But that's an additional, and you'll see this in the final report, that's an additional $14 million in projected inflation between today's cost budgeting and today to what you can expect um, when you get into the 2025 bidding environment. So he's just trying to project out uh, based on information we have today and what a project will cost of this magnitude um, in 2025. Councilor Strong. I was wondering if any of the projected um, assistance through the Inflation Reduction Act was considered in our pricing. In a, in a roundabout way, I'll say yes. When what you can see up here in a 7%, which the team landed on for inflation, uh, factoring out to 2025, they're, when we're looking at reports from either the AGC or ENR and what they're projecting for certain material prices, everybody's wary to say that you're going to see, going back to the days of projecting 3% to 4% inflation in a given year for construction. But you'll see things that are targeted like 20% steel reduction in the next year or certain material prices that are expected to come down. But you're also hearing on the flip side of that, that metal pricing for metal panels is continuing to go up next year. So we're trying to factor in what is a realistic um, inflation percentage to carry year over year. The hope would be that you don't realize a 7% over that entire period, but we're also feeling like that's a, a conservative number to be at uh, given what is historically true for construction inflation year over year. Yes, and I was specifically referring to um, clean energy, other issues as we address, you know, trying to see if that would be indeed a 5 to 15 percent increase on our total um, given the um, other environmentally uh, green buildings, clean buildings, clean process that are outlined in that, in that, uh, in that act. If I could add, that's a really good point. There's dollars out there potentially to reduce the cost. Mm -hmm. um, that is more on the funding side of it mm -hmm. um, that we'll have to strongly look at. And I would encourage us to really look at that. Um, so this is kind of what the total cost, so as much as we can reduce that through grants or other funding um, or innovative ways that we can get some type of credit for, I think that would be wonderful. So it's a really good point that we should stick a pin in that and make sure we come back to that as we look at funding this and what are our or options. With the infrastructure plan, I, I could be a little bit behind. I'm not sure if there's been any guidance given or money actually flowing to the states at this point. I know there was some, some holdups along the way, so that will obviously change by 2025, so we would hopefully have some better sense of it as we move forward into 2023, I would hope, and as we structure kind of what our game plan would be for funding this, I think that's something we really need to look strongly at. And that's a good point that we don't necessarily want to credit ourselves any funding benefits on the cost side of things because we want to make sure we have a good understanding of what the costs will be that we have to pay for through the various means that we might be able to pursue. No. Comes first, I, yeah, I guess I'm just concerned that design, significant design changes would make it so that we would be qualified for some of these things. Um, so we have this plan, but that a significant design change maybe would actually make it be a less uh, expensive project. And it was our intent in the design, and I'll, I want to separate here because they are different animals. Maintenance, there are certain things you have to do with a maintenance building to make it work, right? Uh, we had originally explored an east-west option and a north-south op option, and we've landed on recommending the north-south option uh, for constructability purposes, actually as part of our general site costs, um, also in dialogue with some of the residents in terms of how that helps us manage flow of, of vehicles. On the one hand, a north-south orientation tends to be less beneficial for, for passive strategies, but actually for maintenance, it's a, it's a more valuable <coughs> orientation as it relates to daylight. So actually in that sense, north-south is, is doing a lot of things for us. With both BFW, excuse me, and license and passport, we specifically were planning them using passive design strategies. So providing sufficient space between the buildings so that there's no uh, self-shading, both of those buildings and structures are oriented east-west, which is most effective for a kind of basic passive design strategy. Um, as Dustin has noted, including B3 means that we have a fairly high level of 
performance of both our exterior envelope, our walls, our roof, our foundation, as well as performance of our mechanical systems. And so we are already very well placed to have incorporated B3 as a baseline cost um, in this, as well as some of those preliminary design strategies that we have. Uh, it's a little too early for us to go further in terms of actual windows and doors, uh, but at least in our preliminary massing, we were trying to make some of those uh, adjustments, Council Member Strayan, that you were kind of noting would well place us for consideration as being kind of thoughtful uh, environmental stewards. Hey, Mr. Mayor, if I could, I think as we get to that next phase of final design, those are things that we could really sort out a little bit more. We set the stage here, but we need to roll up the sleeves a little bit and really look at then what's the cost benefit of doing this beyond this, the sustainability part. Are we able to get some additional funding or help lower our costs? I think that can be sorted out as we get into the final design and really get down to the final plans. I'm looking to the design professionals, but I think that's how it would typically work is when you get really specific. Great. Other, oh, Council Moretti. Uh, when we look at this, obviously this is designed out as 25 to 27. Um, let's say we got to 2030. Do you feel like we would need to go back to a pre-design process or just go to that final design process with something like this? Assuming the goals were the same, but I mean, if we get that far out, do we need to, how deep do we have to go backwards to go forwards? I think we would recommend if you're truly looking that far out, which is enough out. I mean, I'm looking, I'm just, right. <laughs> things that, happen. That, things happen, right, yeah. Things happen. Um, it would be beneficial to touch base with the design team. I don't think you would have to go through a full pre-design process, but it would be checking in with someone who says, oh, you know, there's been the latest technology mm -hmm. in our equipment has changed, and that's something we couldn't foresee seven years ago. You might have amounted a certain capacity in our program, but there's an opportunity for fine tuning. Mm -hmm. uh, for things like VFW license and passport, uh, probably different magnitudes of change and actually different between the two of those. I would assume that the VFW actually might have some consistency program wise. They might uh, maybe explore differences in some of their goals for revenue. Uh, but with license and passport, you know, continuing technology will support different understandings of volumes of service um, and that certainly might change. So there would be a benefit of uh, having a team review the last report and make any small updates, but it wouldn't require, I don't think, full well, departmental conversations. And I would just offer up that this, the same exact team independently was chosen to work with the city of Rosemont on their upcoming public works and PD facility. And they had a study done a number of years prior to the team coming on board. And even at that point, it was part of the next step when you were getting into schematic design to go back and reevaluate the existing program. And just to make sure as a starting point, uh, what's been held true and what's been presented in the past is gonna hold true as you start to go into design. Right. Thank you, Council Member. The, the two-step uh, approach here with the programming and master planning and the pre-design phase has set that up so that in 2030, there's a lot of building blocks there that are just those quick references as opposed to a complete reinvention. So, okay, thank you. And I suppose it's reasonable to say that uh, if we get to a point where we're looking at starting construction in 2030, some of our inflationary uh, assumptions will have, you know, so things will have changed just on that side of it too. So at the very minimum, just the financial analysis mm -hmm. would have to be redone. But mm -hmm. certainly I think the point is well taken that that updating any of the assumptions regarding programming and all those other things makes a lot of sense. So good good question, uh, good explanation of what we might have to look at there. Great. Um, and I think that brings us, if I remember right, that's the second to the last slide after, uh, uh, before a, uh, no, that Thank was you. very much it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So any uh, other questions that uh, council members have or any other information we want to maybe have? Uh, council member Etten? I have or? a question for city manager. Oh, council member Etten. I um, thought you were deferring to council member Josh. <laughs> well, I would do that too, but um, uh, asking our city manager, um, and maybe this is something we have to discuss further, uh, obviously separately, but wondering how these new updated numbers affect what we have passed, uh, that we have approached the legislature about and then would come to our community for, that we, do we need to redo that or, or things like that? Again, that may be a discussion for another day, but obviously this changes what, something in some way. Yeah. Yes, uh, Council Member Atten, it definitely does. So, I mean, first of all, generally speaking, since it wasn't passed in this legislature, talking about the sales mm -hmm. tax to fund uh, this, we would have to go through another 
series of passing a resolution regardless. But okay. uh, we know we have a better sense of the cost, and the costs are much higher than what we asked for. I was just going to pull up. Um, we had previously projected the maintenance facility at $42 million and then license and passport center at uh, seven, so a total of $49 million. So we'll have to dramatically increase. Mm -hmm. I haven't done the calculations on exactly how many years that would take for a sales tax, but we were at 16 years, and we also had $16 million for the PED bridge, and that you can have a conversation whether that's still something we want to do. Um, so we had a total of 60 five million dollars as our ask and i think it was somewhere in the 82 million dollar total collection we would do over 16 years that would cover the debt issuance and the interest so we have to play with those numbers a little bit and see where we would get to and i think the reasonable assumption they're not going to probably approve something more than 20 years um so what that gets us as far as that so we'd have to do those calculations but certainly that is one strategy that we would want to revisit and have a conversation okay. about Yep. Can, can you clarify when we were talking about acceptable uses of that sales tax um, and that this um, city uh, structure is it does fall into the sales tax allowable uses? Yes, it has to meet the regional significance test, and we put forward the reasons why we believed it was. Um, and um, if you will recall, uh, we had some public. Uh, hearings and then we're eventually in the omnibus tax bills both the House and the Senate as well as other cities and that did not pass so we seem to at least uh, meet the standard for certain legislators to um, consider that uh, eligible and then of course the next step if that was approved we'd have to go to the voters in a referendum vote as soon as we could do that now would be in 2024 it has to be a general election so um, we missed the window of opportunity for this election so that's somewhat driving the conversation about starting in 25 mm -hmm. at the earliest, if we were to use sales tax. Okay. So, so in other words, the justification that was used originally to request the legislature to allow us to go to the voters for the referendum uh, has not changed. It's Correct. still, the, 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 A, the legislature hasn't changed the criteria nope. at this point, uh, and the project hasn't changed other than we have to figure out whether that that pet bridge remains a part of it. I guess right. at this point. So, All right. Councilmember Groff, just to follow up on that a bit, um, since it is such a long timeline, and we're trying to put some rough dollar amounts to it, what happens if, in the process of that two or three years, this goes up another twenty thousand dollars? That legislature has already determined the dollar amount, so we aren't able to change anything. You are right uh, that we are. <coughs> locked into that amount uh, that we would collect. So we have to be pretty confident in that number and uh, you know, obviously inflation is, is not always predictable. Right. I would mention too that um, we do have um, the debt for the park improvements and the fire station, I think rolling off in 2027, if I'm recalling correctly about that time frame. So you know that's, that's a policy discussion certainly, right. but that's um, some additional um, potential to use to reassign that uh, that debt levy uh, towards a project such as this, but that's for a different conversation, different day. If it helps in terms of that question from Councilmember Groff, I do remember as part of the hearings before the legislature, uh, um, actually both the Senate and the House hearings, um, one of the requesters at that time was Edina, and Edina had gotten approval mm -hmm. in 2021 for going to the voters in 2022. Uh, and they had to come back to the legislature in 2020. Actually, it was Dinah and I think one northern uh, county or city as well, northern Minnesota, also was coming back to get, actually get a legislative approval to go to the voters for additional dollars because they had oh, seen inflationary right. changes to their project mm -hmm. costs. And it may have been more than just those two, but those two stood out. And so that's an example of what can happen is you can even have gotten approval in one session and then your numbers change and you may have to go back at that if you continue to want to use if you continue to want to do the project if you continue to want to use sales tax funding and if it financially works you may have to go back for more yes. potentially just depending on how those costs work out just in the environment that we're in so there's a lot of definitely a lot of factors that are kind of moving at the same time and of course we are seeing inflation go up now but i wonder about historically if you've looked over the last 40 years 
whether this would be projected to continue for you know nine more years out to 2030. I think that seems unlikely from what my understanding is. But. I, I think it does seem unlikely. Historically, you'd fall somewhere in the 3 to 4 percent, typically for construction inflation. So to even have 7 percent up there for another three consecutive years is, you know, I, if I had a crystal ball, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be worth a lot right now <laughs> for the next couple years old. Because I don't think anybody was expecting a 20 percent and then some mm -hmm. 10 to 15 percent. That's that's unheard of. So we're we're in unique times, but uh, the hope is that, and, and what we're reading is that things should should hopefully start to decline on inflation, and that's why we landed on the 7% a year that's in the report. And the 3 to 4% is truly a historic average over the last 50 years, where it really, truly has held steady and had enough of that accommodation. And maybe just to follow up on your last uh, discussion point, you know, certainly at this point, we believe that that 7% um, projected should allow for uh, some of these numbers to come down. Um, if as you're making your funding choices, though, you, you want us to use a different number for that inflation over the course of this, um, we can provide that if, if you want to understand or feel that you have capacity in there for what continues to be an, an unpredictable market. No, I appreciate the 7%. I think that's probably a realistic number for this time. And then uh, my last question was, uh, where's the stock market going? <laughs> <laughs> and what well, lottery ticket to buy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Councilmember Groff. So at, at this point, uh, we are being asked to accept the Civic Campus pre-designed final report that's been presented this evening. Uh, I do want to also note that we do have an opportunity for public comment. I don't know, Mr. Trudgen, if we've got any remote participants at this point. I think we only had our consultant last. Yeah, I think, yeah, we have two people on, but both with the consultant. Okay. Um, so. And I don't see anyone in the chambers from the public who may wish to speak to this, but we certainly would have wanted to provide that opportunity. Um, it's worth noting that accepting the uh, report this evening is not approving a project. It's not approving a uh, funding source or method. Uh, it's merely uh, acknowledging and accepting the, the report and the work that's been done and the, the ability to use this going forward as sort of a basis for future steps. Um, with that, uh, from the council's perspective, do we want to have a motion to uh, accept the final report? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Groff, seconded by Councilmember Etten to accept the final report. Discussion of the motion, um, uh, maker of the motion, Councilmember Groff. No, I think uh, it's covered a lot of the things we've talked about in the last, you know, during these months and almost a year, I guess. Um, I think it was thorough and I appreciate it. Right. As the second year council member, Atten. No, thanks right. for your work. Other discussion? The staff. Right. Uh, once again, we've got the motion before us to accept the final report of the pre design of the Civic Campus specific to maintenance, uh, license center passport, and VFW. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously four to zero. That report is accepted. And thank you all uh, and everybody in the consulting team for all the work, uh, as well as staff, everybody who's been contributing from our side on, on making sure we have a good idea of what's, what the needs are and how we can fit it all together. So appreciate everybody's work on this. And as you noted, there are further steps before we can get anywhere close to uh, uh, shovels in the ground, so to speak. So uh, we'll, we'll have to figure that out, or somebody will have to figure that out down the road. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, we have our final uh, business item this evening, which is to uh, consider appointment of city council members to a panel for interviewing a city attorney candidates. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Trudgen again for this item. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. As noted in the uh, RCA, we um, have released the RFP for civil and prosecution uh, attorney services. As you know, uh, our professional services policy is every three years. Uh, we do go out for bid unless waived by the city council. We have done that uh, several times with our current legal counsel, both for the prosecution and civil uh, side of it. Um, last year, as we were up against the end of the contract, the council did grant a one-year extension of the current contract in order to give us uh, more time to prepare the RP and put that out. So here we are. Uh, we're ready to do that. As I said, the uh, RFP uh, has been out there. We did note uh, the breakdowns of the weight and the criteria for uh, the selection process for both the civil and uh, prosecution. Uh, we do uh, need to have um, per city policy that the city council be represented on the interviews for the 
civil, that's the city attorney uh, side of the contract, uh, as well as staff. So I uh, have asked for council members that are interested and more importantly are available on November 3rd. Uh, at this point, uh, we would like you to block out that whole day. We're not sure how many interviews we'd be doing, but uh, hopefully not the whole day, but at least a substantial portion of the day. So I did give you all a heads up so you can take a look at your calendars uh, here, but uh, asking that the city council then tonight officially appoint two members to that panel and then we'll go from there and report back um, uh, later in the year here to award the contracts. So with that, I'll pause. All right, uh, and you said two council members? Uh, two council members, well, three council members. I heard from two council members that could do that on that day. But you're looking for two? Two, yes, yes. To, to serve, all right. Sorry, yes. So, and I believe I was one that said I would be available on that day. Correct. And I confirmed on my calendar that I did block out the time. Mm -hmm. And the other council member was? I'm able. Oh, okay. Council member Groff, all right. Any, anybody uh, uh, want to uh, fight us for it? Uh, whatever. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, second. second. Yeah. Fighting. What, what are we getting into here? Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's so been moved by Councilmember Ratt and seconded by Councilmember Strawn to force Councilmember Groff and I to serve in <laughs> <Yes>. this way. <laughs> uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously four to zero. Those, item, or those appointments are made. All right, and we look forward to that process. That brings us to uh, council direction on council member initiated agenda items. We have the one item okay. converter discussion and council member Strawn had brought it uh, forward at our last meeting, I think it was. Uh, so we are here to just uh, provide some direction on uh, putting this on a future agenda or, or not or what to do if that's the case. I don't know, council member Strawn, if you've got a mm -hmm. uh, presentation or comments to make at this just time. comments, okay. thank you. Right. Um, as we know, we've had a long history in Roseville and adjacent areas of having catalytic converter thefts. On September 19th, Bloomington, the city of Bloomington passed a catalytic converter ordinance making it a misdemeanor to be um, in possession of a unattached catalytic converter without a receipt. On October 3rd, Savage also passed a similar ordinance with the same parameters. Within the two, last two months, many municipalities across the country and state have been working toward this. We have worked um, for the last few years to attempt to have a catalytic converter uh, state law and uh, our own Senator John Marty has been working on this tirelessly year after year uh, with not a lot of advancement. On May 11, 2021, uh, Chief Scheider uh, forwarded a letter in support of uh, Senator Marty's Senate File 2491 and at that time, she indicated when our officers stop people driving around with several cutoff catalytic converters and a sawzall, often without a reasonable explanation as to how they gain possession of the used converters, we are unable to proceed with the prosecution unless we can specify, identify the vehicles the converters belong to. The proposed, and at that time, they were talking about marking vehicles. Um, unless we show they know the converters they purchased were stolen. So there's just always, there's these pieces. This would be much better served as a state item, but it continues to get passed off year after year. I spoke with Troy Metzger, who owns Dave's Auto um, on Hamlin Avenue, and he indicated that at this time, they're seeing about one, uh, one to two catalytic converters a week coming off of vehicles in our area. At the high, that was about two to three, so it's a little bit lower right now. Right now, it is several days to several months back order to get a catalytic converter, um, depending on the vehicle and the model and the extent of damage. He said damage costs can go anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars per car, depending on um, how well they know what they're doing and everything else. <laughs> He said in any other market, this, this most of these cars would have been totaled. Um, a lot of them are older cars. Um, this in a, uh, disproportionately affects the poor. Um, the models typically have been Kias, Hyundais, Priuses, Mitsubishis, but now um, recently he's seen an uptick in Volkswagens and even Ford F-150s. Mm -hmm. Just noting that um, the insurance companies regularly come in and pay, but that they're starting to fight these. And they're saying that they, you know, what did you do to prevent it? And um, 
and he just said of the poor are disproportionately impacted. Most of them, um, when they have a fully paid for car, they only have comprehensive, they don't have provision, they don't have a means to come up with this money, so some of these vehicles sit with him for weeks on end. Um, and yet it is the only way that those folks can um, get around. So he was very much in support of doing anything um, along these lines, and Chief Scheider also echoed that um, in asking her specifically about having an ordinance in Roseville just within the last week, she told me an ordinance would give us another option. I don't know that it will slow things down, but at least we'd have a tool and she'd appreciate the tool. So I'd like to move forward with at least having the city uh, staff study the possibility of a uh, ordinance that would uh, make it possession of a catalytic converter, um, as noted, a misdemeanor and uh, work to protect the people of Roseville. Great, any questions for Council Member Strahan? Council Member Groff? Not so much a question, but I did check with Chief Schneider today also, and she said exactly what you, you said, that it would be a tool that we could use, of course. Nothing solves everything problem in the world, but it would be something. So I know from people I've talked to, as you know, while door knocking, <laughs> that it does come up quite frequently. Um, and people, even if they try to put those cage, have those cages put on, it's it's an expense to them. So mm -hmm. I think I think they would appreciate some action on this. Great. Uh, unless there's any objection, I think this would come forward. I don't know if you've got a particular time frame in mind, or if staff has a sense of when this could be on an agenda for consideration. Perhaps a draft ordinance. Yeah, you know. Uh, Mr. Mayor, assuming that we use the Bloomington model, I think that's pretty straightforward and put together. We would have to notice it for 10 days, so that probably gets to the 24th um, meeting. We can shoot for that if that is acceptable for everybody. I think that would be great. Unless okay. there's any objection. We'll plan on that. That's good. Right. And I think it, it's probably worthwhile to do some research about, um, um, you know, other, obviously they haven't mm -hmm. probably had a lot of experience with it up to this point, but if there's any other tools that we should be yeah. looking at in addition to this, I think that'd be important to have a sense of as well. And I don't know, Mr. Goggin, you pulled your microphone uh, <laughs> towards you as if you might have something to say, so. Mayor Council, I, obviously, you know, more tools in our tool belt would be good on this issue. I think it's important that we should look at um, potential tools outside of these ordinances that are being passed. I personally have qu questions about their legality um, and um, um, pushing the um, burden of proof upon defendants and whether or not these ordinances would hold up uh, under judicial scrutiny. So I think it'd be important, I'm not putting the kibosh or anything, I'm just saying mm -hmm. it, it is a good uh, point to look at right. um, a, a wider range of potential options as well. We'll look forward to additional word on that from you at the discussion on the 24th. All right, I think that's uh, the plan then, is we'll put that on the agenda for the 24th. Perfect. All right, if there's nothing further on this item then, uh, thank you, Councilmember Strawn. Uh, we'll uh, look at, we've got a number of City Council and EDA minutes to consider this evening. Uh, we have Council minutes from September 12th, September 13th, uh, which I think was a special meeting, September 19th. Uh, and September 26th, we also have EDA minutes from September 19th. Are there any uh, changes or corrections that need to additionally be made to any of those from a council perspective uh, or a motion to prove one more or all of those uh, as presented? Smorgasbord of opportunities there. <laughs> I would move them all. I'll second that. Uh, all right. Councilmember Ratton moves all of the minutes as presented. Councilmember Graf seconds. Any discussion on the motion? No. All right, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously 4-0, and those minutes are approved. Uh, that brings us to the consent agenda. I'll turn it over to City Manager Trudgeon to introduce the consent items this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Agenda item 10A approves payments in the amount of $1,437,749. Item 10B approves a temporary liquor license for Bent Distillery for an event on October 29th. Item 10C authorizes entering into a professional services agreement with Tokle Inspections for electrical inspection services. Item 10D authorizes uh, the city to enter into a State of Minnesota Anti-Heroin Task Force Joint Powers Agreement. This agreement will allow the Roseville Police Department to access funds to re reimburse the city for overtime investigative costs relating to the distribution of heroin and prescription opioids. 
Item 10E approves a janitorial services contract with Lynn Building Maintenance. Lynn Building Maintenance currently provides janitorial services for most of our city facilities, and, the, and this cost for these services are budgeted each year, and we are very pleased with their service. And then finally, item 10F approves an amendment to the lease agreement between the city and T-Mobile regarding the use of city property at the Civic Campus for T-Mobile's telecommunications equipment. This amendment allows for T-Mobile to lease an additional 50 square feet for their equipment. As a result of this lease uh, amendment, the city will receive an additional $4,284 in lease revenue. And that is the consent agenda. All right, thank you, Mr. Trudgeon. Is there a motion to approve the consent items? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilman Rat uh, Strahan, second by Councilman Ratton. Uh, and uh, discussion on the motion? No. Um, just to double check, was that additional 50 square feet accounted for in the <laughs> Civic Campus Master Plan that we just approved? I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, but I'll double back make sure <laughs> right, that we're, right. we're we'll not, be sure if that was part of that white yeah. dot that we had under the <laughs> green the white dot. All right. No. <laughs> uh, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda items signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously four to zero. Uh, future agenda review, communications, reports, announcements. Uh, City Manager Trudgeon on the future agendas. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our next meeting is Monday, kind of more of a work session format, although we will probably have some consent agenda items as well. So we want to receive the results of the utility rate study. We have employed Ellers to continue to take a look uh, at our rate structure to make sure we are properly capturing um, the dollars we need to uh, fund our operations and our future capital needs. I would note one huge variable in the water rates, and we talked a little bit about that at the underbilling, um, and that's certainly a factor. I would not say it's a ma major factor at this point as far as the rate increase, but uh, it is the increase we have from St. Paul water, which is 9% um, of our cost. So that is a major driver on that. We are going back and having additional conversations with them, but the rate study does take that um, into effect here. So that does impact the amount of rate increase and the length of time uh, that it does. But we'll break it all down. We also will have information about stormwater um, rates as well. Um, we also uh, want to receive a report from Community Development Director Gunlock about the tenant notification ordinance. As you know, she has a series of meetings throughout the community. I think the ordinance uh, itself is in pretty good shape, um, but we want to bring it back just for a report back and have any further discussions before uh, the City Council considers approving it. And then we do need to set a date to canvass the general election date. So it will be the week following the election. We will not have the information until that week. So we really have the gamut of Monday through Friday uh, as far as when we want to do that. Um, we don't have a council meeting that Monday night, so uh, we could look at Monday uh, night if you really want to, or you can do a noon time or a five o'clock time on one of those dates. So I will send an email out and suggest some dates to everybody, but just keep that in mind. So I'm trying to remember what that date would be. That would probably be 14th is Monday. 14th, yeah, November, week of November 14th. <laughs> And no, is, there, right, is there a time frame in which, within which statute requires us to... By case? the end of that week. So by the end Friday. of that week, yeah. okay. So, so some, got some, some more time. It's not and we wouldn't have any results by the 10th? No. No. <laughs> they don't promise anything until uh, end week. of the day on Friday. Oh, I was going to yeah. say, do we expect results on, on the 8th? We, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, we expect the results that evening, but the final uh, certified uh, results, yeah, gotcha. which we have to do. So, and once again, uh, just a reminder, we just need a quorum to actually, you know, uh, pass it. But uh, I'll send out some further communication on that. Okay. So on the 24th, we have Native American Heritage Month proclamation. Um, actually, I think the Youth Commissioner appointment might be on the 7th, but uh, could be on the 24th. We want to bring forward a discussion of the THC regulations. We've been uh, looking at an ordinance, but there's some uh, important policy discussions the council needs to have first about what to put in. We also want to provide an opportunity for those um, that are either retailers or in the THC industry to weigh in as well. So we are notifying them of, of this, so they'll be welcome to join us in a conversation. We'll talk about the water uh, bill underbilling. Um, we should have a pretty good sense in capturing exactly uh, what the impact was across the user system here, and we'll try to break that down and talk about what, a what the total impact was, and then some options um, if we want to consider uh, recovering those dollars and how we want to do that. Uh, conditional use for the drive-through at uh, Twin Lakes Parkway Starbucks that will be consent agenda item that was approved by the Planning Commission last Wednesday. One of the outlots they have out there um, in front of Walmart along Cleveland Avenue, Twin Lakes Parkway, um, mm -hmm. in the little green areas will now be a Starbucks. On the 7th, uh, we will have an EDA meeting. We have some um, business items regarding the harbor development about a TBRA that's uh, 
t uh, that's tax-based revitalization tax access, backwards. TERA, not TRBA, mm -hmm. uh, loan documentation subordination agreement, uh, professional services agreement with CEE, and they deal with our loans, Golden Shovel and MCCD, that's the open to business. Uh, so just kind of renewal of those contracts. Want to approve the 2023 meeting calendar for the EDA, and then uh, review the Choose Roseville campaign. I think that is completed now, so we want to give an update on uh, what we saw on that. At the regular meeting, we'll uh, talk specifically about the utility rates across the board. This is kind of our traditional check-in. Uh, we don't always have a, a utility uh, st study to report on, so they're coming back to back, but this is another chance to keep looking at that. Take an initial look at the fee schedule uh, for 2023. We have been working on massage therapy, Chapter 309, continuing to work um, through some of those issues, and we have an ordinance I think it's in pretty good shape, working very closely with the city attorney. And then uh, look at our city council and EDA calendar. Um, at that point, um, and I believe I've communicated this out, that um, one of our regular council meeting nights uh, would be on June 19th. That is Juneteenth Day. Mm -hmm. So it really behooves us to have a conversation on whether we want to declare Juneteenth Day as a holiday, and that is my understanding needs to uh, be approved by the city council. So we'll concurrently have a conversation about that. Um, obviously, you can set a calendar and change it a little bit later, but uh, I think it really is going to be important that we sort that out now so we know as we can plan ahead. And we can plan uh, uh, our meeting on a different day, perhaps a Tuesday or look at the week before. But uh, so just preview that a little bit. All right. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Other questions on the uh, review of the future agenda? Any council member initiated items for future agendas or reports, announcements, communications? Just an update on Visit Roseville. We had our meeting last week, and uh, Representative Jamie Becker Finn was there to talk about the legislative session and the little bit of progress she made, as you know, about the uh, the motel licensing, hotel motel licensing. Um, they spoke about trying to get the state hospitality uh, lobbying group to be more supportive, but I don't think that's going to affect the result in the end. Anyway, Jamie Becker Finn thought she would have better luck next year with right. the legislature. So we'll see what happens. Is there anything else from that that you can remember? No, we talked a lot about uh, hotels uh, yeah. licensing, but no, nothing else. All right. If there's no further uh, communications right, announcements, oh, Council Member I just wanted to thank the um, Jeannie Kelsey and the folks who put together the employment employer fair mm -hmm. on Wednesday. It was a nice event and um, I think a lot of people really saw a useful uh, purpose for it. Um, I got to go not only as council, but also as an employer. So it was nice to have two hats, but it was a really great opportunity to connect folks who maybe would be beneficiaries of many of the programs that we work on here, to have them in our facility where we can reach out to them and share some of the housing, um, first generation housing programs, and some of them hadn't heard about mapping prejudice and other items that we have been working on for a long period of time. And so it was nice to be able to share that. So I, I applaud Jeannie on, um, and Ling Becker from Ramsey County on the uh, thinking outside the box in that realm because I don't think I've ever been invited to something like that before and I thought it was useful. Yeah. And, and that's a good point that uh, Ramsey County was participating too because I think there's a lot of um, uh, lack of awareness amongst employers of all the workforce programs that are out there and available that can maybe help with uh, employees or help even getting employees. So certainly that's that was good as well. So yeah, that was a good program. And hopefully it'll continue to be done and continue to, to have more and more people participating. With that, the only other item on the agenda is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And moved by Councilman Redd and second by Councilman Strong to adjourn. No discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.